our science students to climate lesson number four. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about climate change. Now, first, we're going to look at what I call natural climate change. These are causes of climate change that are completely normal and periodic and predictable and have happened since the beginning of Earth's history. And that we're going to look at two different extremes, uh, an ice age and a greenhouse time. And these long-term changes happen very slowly. This is different than human-caused climate change, which we're going to look at later on and happen fairly quickly. So first, let's look at ice ages. The most recent ice age that we had was in the Pleistocene, and it ended about 10,000 years ago. But that was not the only ice age. It was just the most recent ice age. We've been having ice ages since the Proterozoic. And on this chart, you can see this, is, this line in the middle here would be sort of average temperatures. So temperatures on the left, where the curve dips to the left, are going to be colder than normal. And those represent ice ages. And if I'm on the right-hand side, it represents warmer than normal times, in which case I would be in a greenhouse. And you can see there have been one, two, three, four ice ages uh, prior to our Pleistocene one, which is up here, the most recent one. But there have also been many greenhouse times. And if you notice, the biggest period of time in Earth's history that was a greenhouse time was actually during the time of the dinosaurs in the Mesozoic. So here's a picture of the extent of the last ice age in which the ice sheets came down from the poles. And they covered most of North America all of Canada, Greenland, there's Iceland, most of Northern Europe and Asia. And the ice was very thick uh, here in New York. We were under a mile of ice in many locations and much of our landscape that we see today in New York uh, was caused by the glaciers. The only ice sheets that remain today from that last ice age are the Antarctic ice sheet, which is on the continent of Antarctica and is quite large, and the Greenland ice sheet, which is the very last little piece of the northern hemisphere's ice sheet uh, and is not, not as big. Um, honor students, you're going to have the opportunity to do an honors project on these two ice sheets called the GRACE Honors Project, uh, which will look at satellite data of these two ice sheets and how they're changing. Here's a picture of the Antarctic ice sheet. It's a river of meltwater coming off of it. It has the river even has the meanders that we might see in a regular river. So there's many different reasons why ice ages form. Um, you don't need to know the specifics of that, but for example, if continents are located over the poles, that tends to make it colder in the winter and can trigger an ice age. Uh, different changes with the ocean currents and continental drift can trigger an ice age. So there's many ways that ice ages can get started, and plate tectonics um, can take a role in that. So let's focus now more on greenhouse and how we get the earth to heat up and what causes some of those things. So from a uh, heat budget standpoint, if we have more heat coming in than goes out, then the earth is going to heat up. Or if we have more heat that goes out than comes in, we're going to have the earth cooling down. If the heat coming in and the heat going out are balanced, then the climate will be fairly stable. So what are some things that can upset the heat budget that are naturally occurring? One is uh, energy output from the sun. 
the sun has an 11 year cycle of sunspots. So these dark areas on the sun um, are sunspots. And when we have a lot of sunspot activity, uh, the, uh, we actually get a, a little bit more heat coming from the sun. And this happens on an 11 year cycle. Other things that happen, our Earth, as you know, is tilted on its axis, and the, this axis points sometimes towards the sun, in which case we would be in summertime, or away from the sun would be our wintertime. But this axis, although it stays at 23 degrees, it, it wobbles around, kind of like a top that would be spinning. And that wobble can cause slight changes in the amount of heat coming into the earth. Another thing that can upset the heat balance is a lot of volcanic activity. When we have a lot of volcanic eruptions. You put a lot of ash and aerosols into the air and that can cause um, the sunlight not to make it all the way down to the earth gets reflected back into space, and so you get less incoming solar radiation, and therefore the climate tends to cool down. So periods where we have a lot of volcanoes going off, we tend to have slightly cooler climates in the years after that. So those are all natural causes of climate change. But what we are concerned about nowadays is how humans are causing climate change. And this is very different than those other causes because human activities are changing the climate much, much faster than any of the natural causes that I just mentioned. And that means this is very new for the Earth to have this much change so quickly. So what are some of the ways that humans can change the climate. And in this picture you can see one of the factors that we can't ignore is uh, overpopulation. So the more people there are, the, the bigger the impact of all of these changes are going to be on the climate. Now it's not just temperature that is affected uh, in climate um, by humans, but also uh, humidity, wet and dry. So here's an example of what we call desertification, which means turning land into desert. And here you can see uh, this side of the fence looks fairly normal with vegetation, and this side looks very bare. This side has been overgrazed by livestock, so that means they're putting cattle probably on the land and they put too many on there, uh, too many for the amount that the uh, climate can sustain and the cows eat all the vegetation and then it dries out and then new plants can't grow as easily. And here you can see the effect that that can even have on cows, um, starvation and lack of food for the herd can be a disaster. But overall, desertification is a problem, uh, particularly in parts of the world that rely too heavily on livestock. And here in this diagram, the red areas are areas that are at risk of turning into a desert. The gray areas are already desert. And here, for example, you can see the 30 degree deserts of the Sahara uh, from our sinking air wind belts right here. Um, down here in Australia, this 30 degree south uh, sinking air wind belt. But all around the rim, you can see areas that are red are not supposed to be desert, and yet they're turning into desert very quickly. Uh, in North America, a lot of our uh, Wild West, due to overgrazing of cattle out there and very um, low precipitation, um, we are also at risk of uh, turning a lot of the West into deserts. So this is an important problem for climate change. Another one is deforestation. Uh, clear cutting of forests is a big problem. And in this picture you see um, 
burning of rainforests. So both of these are usually done to clear the land for other uses besides forestry. And the, the problem with that is that forests, not only do the hold, they hold the soil in place and prevent erosion, but the trees themselves um, absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. So the trees actually help prevent uh, global warming. But if you cut the trees down, then of course they can't do that job either. So deforestation also tends to make the climates drier and warmer. Now in this picture, the red areas again are areas at risk of being deforested. And you can see here the Amazon jungle basin, lots of red there as the jungle is cut down primarily for agricultural purposes. What's interesting to note, though, on this uh, diagram is the dark green areas are actually areas where there are now more forests than there used to be. Uh, and you can see the entire east coast of the United States is, has good news. Scandinavia has good news. Uh, more forests there than there were, say, 100 years ago when a lot of the forests were cut down for agriculture. So it's not all bad news. There is some good news there. Urbanization, so the building of cities, increases temperature. So cities tend to be several degrees warmer than the surrounding countryside. So that certainly can add to climate change. And the big one, of course, is the burning of fossil fuels. Okay, so fossil fuels, when you burn them in a car or in a factory or in a power plant, releases greenhouse gases. And these are the primary cause of human-induced global warming. So three uh, of our greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide is the most common, methane and nitrous oxide. These come from a lot of our human activities. The biggest one is from electricity, from power stations. Usually coal-fired uh, coal power stations are a big cause of that. Um, industrial processes, that would be factories, transportation fuels, that's your cars, buses, airplanes, land use and burning, uh, agriculture, uh, extraction of fossil fuels, residential use of fossil fuels, and waste disposal all contribute greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide is the one most commonly associated with burning fossil fuels, methane, um, that can be from um, waste products, uh, waste disposal, and nitrous oxide from a variety of industrial um, applications in agriculture. So let's just review real quick what the greenhouse effect is, and that is short wavelength sunlight comes in, gets absorbed by the earth, and at night, long wavelength heat, otherwise known as infrared, is given off. But the greenhouse gases act like the greenhouse glass here, and they won't let the long wavelength out. They let the short wavelength in, but they don't let the long wavelength out. So it gets trapped in this greenhouse here. And uh, here would be the atmosphere. You have your short wavelength sunlight coming in, being absorbed by the Earth, and then re-radiated back as infrared heat and it can't get out because carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide in the atmosphere traps it. So that's the um, basic process for the greenhouse effect. And here's the data known as uh, the Keeling curve. This is a, a famous curve that shows um, since 1960, on the side here are the concentrations of carbon dioxide increasing. And as uh, we went through the different decades, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, into 2000 and beyond, you can see con carbon dioxide concentrations have been increasing steadily and actually increasing 
um, in their rate of increase. So we are looking at more and more carbon dioxide from burning of fossil fuels. So what are some of the consequences of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, the greenhouse effect is that we're going to start to melt a lot of those ice sheets that are still left. The Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets are sh shrinking and that ice melts into the oceans and then the oceans rise. So sea level rise is expected to be a big problem in the coming centuries. It's already a problem in some areas as you can see here. Some low-lying um, countries are already experiencing flooding. And if all of the Antarctic ice sheets melted, uh, we estimate as much as 20 feet of sea level rise could occur along the coastlines, and that could flood much of the world's coastal areas. About 80% of the world's population lives within 100 miles of a coastline. And so flooding the coastline would mean displacing a lot of people. Here's what Florida would look like if we had 20 feet of sea level rise. So these lighter green areas would all be areas underwater. So global warming will also cause um, shifts in uh, climate zones. So areas that were cooler and wetter may now become hotter and drier and crops could fail, um, diseases could take hold that weren't otherwise common in a particular climate. We expect more extreme weather, not just um, more hurricanes, but bigger hurricanes, bigger tornadoes, more tornadoes, um, even more extreme weather. So not just hot or bigger storms, but maybe more fluctuations between cold and warm. So unpredictable weather, more extreme weather that can lead to natural disasters. And we do want to look at our sister planet, Venus, which is a warning for us. Venus has what we call a runaway greenhouse effect. Its atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide. It has a thousand times more carbon dioxide in its atmosphere than we have on Earth, which makes the temperature on Venus 800 degrees and higher in degrees Fahrenheit, and that is much too hot to sustain life. And we certainly don't want that to happen to our lovely planet. So Venus is a warning to us. Do not let the greenhouse effect get out of control so that our planet becomes uninhabitable. So that's climate change. Hope that helps. See you next time.